Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. Michael Billington is the doyen of theatre critics. He's been with The Guardian for over 40 years and been in the business even longer than that. Uh, For Vidas in 2015, he has published a magnum opus, um, the title of which is The 101 Greatest Plays from Antiquity to the Present. Michael, it's a wonderful book. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Philip. What made you decide to write this book? Self-education, in a way. Um, I've written a book, as you may remember, called State of the Nation, Mm. about post-war British theatre, which actually was helpful to me because it enabled me to put the plays out the scene, the British plays, in some historical context. And so it seemed logical to move from there to sort of world drama. And in a way, I just wanted to see what I thought, uh, A, with the great plays, see if I could find what constituted greatness in drama and also entertain myself in a way and encourage myself to read and look up and revisit a lot of plays that I knew or half knew. Um, And I suppose finally the aim was to offer readers a sort of challenge and a provocation to say, well, here is my choice. Now what's yours? And already it seems the ball is rolling because (laughs) last week the Guardian published an article by me about the book. And last time I checked, there were about 150 responses. Most of them say, well, of course, he's missed out this, he's missed out that, which I'm expecting. I mean, I don't expect people to say, oh, what a sensible choice. I expect people (laughs) to say, my goodness, how can you write this book and not include X, Y, and Z? So... I mean, it's, it's a, I read the book for mul- multiple reasons, actually. Um, but I say it was partly to, in a way, inform myself and make myself think about drama on a big scale. It seems to be very thoroughly researched. How long did it take you to write? It was actually two years from the day I had lunch. I remember a lunch in, I think, what were we now, January twenty. 20- 13, that's right, with my editor, Dinah Wood of Faber. And she said to me, I had previously said, I don't think I can write another book until I've finished you know, my Guardian mm. career. It's too taxing. And she said, well, if you did, what, what would you write about? And I said, well, <laughs> I've been thinking about a book on you know, 100, 101 greatest play. It was 100 originally. Mm. Um, and she said, oh, that's very interesting. I've got a meeting in a half an hour's time. Do you mind if I mention it? So she went straight <laughs> back from lunch uh, to a meeting at Faber and rang me, I think, that day or possibly the next day, or emailed me to say, oh, we're all very keen on the idea. (laughs) We think you should go ahead. So what was a vague conversation suddenly turned into a concrete reality. You should never have lunch with an editor. It's always a mistake. Well, that is the big (laughs) problem, yes, because I I felt I had to sort of justify the lunch in some way. I mean, having said all that, um, that was fine. And then I started obviously making lists and doing Mm. a lot of reading, and I started the writing fairly soon. I then had a terrible hiatus in, what was it, December 2013, when I had an operation, and for about two months, two or three months, I couldn't do very much, actually, or didn't do very much on the book, and put it aside. And then I got going again in about, <clears throat> by know, February 2014, and finished it, I remember, on New Year's Eve that year. Uh, so I delivered it to the publisher early in 2015, and here we are six months later, and it's out. So I, the actual writing, <clears throat> I mean, the whole thing, you know, from planning to finishing took two years. There are 101 plays in there, as the title suggests. There are. At what point did you have the majority? Did you come into the project with 101 plays in mind? I'm sure the answer's no. Did you come in with 80 in mind, 20 in mind, none in mind? Well, I did drop a list, actually, of 100. Um, and I look at that list occasionally now, and it's very different from the list in might the be. book. Mm. And as I wrote, and this was a constant surprise to my editor, mm. Dinah Wood, to mm. whom I must pay mm. great tribute, she kept saying, well, that wasn't in your list originally. Mm. I said, no, but I've been reading a play mm. by Schnitzler, let's say, or mm. whoever it might be, and I think it's got to go in. And therefore something had to come out. Mm. And I found this particularly with 20th century drama, and particularly the closer we got to the present, mm. the more the list began to change. Mm. And it, it is... I think the hardest part of the book, or the most controversial part of the book in some ways, is discerning which plays of the last, say, 30 or 40 mm. years deserve this kind yes. of um, imprimatur. Mm. And I kept changing as I went along. And to get this out of the way, it started as 100, and it did become mm. 101, because Dinah said, Michael, I think there's a play 
that should be in there that you haven't mentioned. And I'm not going to reveal to anyone, not even to you, what it was. <laughs> um, but she was right. And the book is the stronger for that play being in, I think. Anyway, there we are. Um, that was the process. And you said there was a hiatus, but ignoring the hiatus, was it just fun to re read, research and write? That was the real fun, actually. Mm. Um, and I think particularly with old plays, classic plays mm. that I wasn't that familiar with. I mean, obviously, you know, as theatre critics, as you well know, we, we, we see modern plays mm. week in, week out. But actually reading or rereading, you know, Greek drama, mm. Elizabethan drama mm. and so on, and then French drama of the 17th century and then German drama of the 18th century and so on. That was really fascinating because there were lots of plays I had a sort of skimpy knowledge mm. of, but I didn't know very well. I mean, a play like Lessing's Nathan the Wise, which I think mm. I've seen twice in my life, mm. and it had lodged in my memory. And then I reread it and thought, my God, this is a fantastic <laughs> play. Um, so that was the fun. Yes, it was the sort of scholarship side of it. Um, and dashing to the London Library and getting mm. lots of books out to mm. supplement my own um, you know, inadequate knowledge of certain areas. I mean, I'm not an academic. I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of world drama. So I had to do quite a bit of reading here. And did you read a lot more than 101 plays in order to distill down? Or did you manage yes. to pretty much read the right ones? Well, um, someone said to me, uh, someone I know from The Guardian said, oh, you must have read 10 plays for every one you included. And I wish <laughs> I could say that was true. Um, I relied heavily on plays of which I had some knowledge. Mm. And I don't think there's a single play in the book that I have not seen somewhere at some time on the stage. It may be only mm. once and it may be mm. 40, 50 years ago. But I think everything in the book I have seen. So I was relying on my theatrical memory mm. as well as my um, knowledge of the plays as texts. Uh, and, it, and I hope that comes across in the book. It is a sort of tribute to the theatre and to actors and directors as well as writers, and particularly for those theatres that excavate forgotten plays. And we both know... You're going to say what? Sam Walters and the Orange Tree, Well, I was going to say Sam Walters <laughs> and the Orange Tree is one who did a play, for instance, like Tolstoy's The Power of Darkness, which no one knows almost except mm. Sam and a handful of others who saw it, um, and The Finborough, uh, mm, which yes. we both go to in Earl's Court. Theatres like that, which diligently dig up old plays... Those theatres were invaluable to me. I mean, obviously, the National Theatre mm. does this as well, but I admire the smaller theatres that do this. And, yes, yeah, Sam Walton and the Orange Tree were particularly good, as we know, at you know, excavating Victorian mm. plays, Edwardian plays, early 20th century plays that other theatres mm. had just forgotten yeah. about. So the Fringe Theatre in London has pay, played a big part in the book. I think it could be self-fulfilling as well, because if I were one of the artistic directors of that kind of theatre, I would be looking at 101 greatest plays and thinking, what can I put on now? So I suspect you might see a good few of the lesser-known plays in there produced over the next few years. Well, I'd be delighted if I did. Um, and in fact, I had a conversation with a young director, whom I won't name, only a few days ago, who, and she hadn't read the book, and she's looking for a play uh, to submit to the National Theatre, actually, for production. And I mentioned, you know, four or five of the plays mm. of the book, and The Power of Darkness was mm. one of them. I said, you, you really ought to know, mm. read that play if you can find a text. Um, that really deserves revival. Um, some of the plays by um, Schiller need, I think, another look. Uh, some of the plays by Kleist need another look. So there's quite a lot of plays in there mm. that I hope someone will take the trouble to excavate. And it's interesting that one of my favourite plays is Harley Granville Barker's Waste, which I yes. see the National Theatre is doing. Anyway. Yes, that's right. It's not because of me, but mm, because no. they, they realised it's a great play too. Yes, it felt like it had been produced fairly recently, and then I realised that it must, must be age getting to me because it's not that recent. Peter Hall did it at the Old Vic. Yeah, when he I remember ran, that. When he ran the theatre there. And there was, a, there was a production ages ago by the RSC that John Barton did, but it's not, it's not a well-known play. And it's a difficult play to stage. It's got a very large cast. What about the other way? Were there plays that you thought were certainties to be in here and when you actually reread them, you suddenly decided they really weren't quite as good as you'd originally thought? Yes. And this is where we get into tricky territory mm. because I have scandalously... I saw a couple of plays from the mid-1950s, possibly. Admitted. Well, I mean, <laughs> going back further, I mean, the, the, 
I, I mentioned this last week in the Guardian article, uh, and it's already caused a lot of argument. King Lear is not uh, there. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I've told this story before, but I'll retell it. Mm. I had lunch with Greg Doran when he took mm. over the RSC, and he asked me about the book, mm. and he said, which Shakespeare's? And he, <laughs> he looked horrified. He said, there's, there's mm. no King Lear. And I said, no, there isn't Greg. And then the man who runs the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford, Michael <laughs> Dobson, a week, a week or two later, said, Mike, I hear you've left out King Lear. <laughs> and he said this to me, Michael Dobson, only a few weeks ago when I was back in Stratford. Um, Shakespeareans are horrified. And so a, <clears throat> a lot of Guardian readers I've discovered... <clears throat> I mean, the reasons are many. <clears throat> I mean, basically, I find King Lear structurally over heavy because the subplot is so such a mirror of the main plot, mm. and you've got two levels of intolerable suffering in the play. Mm. I mean, it's not that I don't admire King Lear and its mm. majesty. It's a play I find I don't. Uh, how should I put this? I don't set out to see it with a spring in my step. <laughs> I think I'm ready for, I'm preparing myself for an endurance test. Straight, I have that feeling about <laughs> quite a number of plays, but King Lear isn't one of them. But... Oh, right. Well, some, no, some people I know have the opposite view. For a similar reason, I reread Beckett's Endgame, and I felt much the same as I do with King Lear. Yeah. I felt an oppression in my head mm. uh, about the unrelieved uh, grimness and mm. hopelessness of the situation. Mm. Um, I've left out waiting for Godot. Yes. And people say, why? Yes, of course, it's a turning point in modern drama. Things are never the same after Godot. And I'm not disputing Beckett's uh, status as a landmark figure. But I feel that play has lost its shock value now. Mm -hmm. It's actually turned from a sort of avant-garde play of 1955 into a comfortable boulevard mm. comedy now, mm. as we know, because it's been revived successfully in the West End and on Broadway. I'm not against that, but it, it seems the play has lost its edge and its bite and its sting. Mm. And the Beckett play I have chosen is an old radio play. All the four. Before, mm. Which is actually becoming now more and more performed. Yes. Uh, there have been three productions in the last five years. Um, and that's Beckett at his most concrete, writing about an Irish rural society that he knew at first hand, uh, and, and writing with a kind of graphic vividness about the, you know, the people in the countryside that he knew well. So I've chosen that. So, I mean, yes, I mean, again, look back in anger's not in. I know, yes, it changed British theatre, mm. etc. We all know that. But Osborne went on to write a better play, yeah. I think, The Entertainer, mm. which keeps coming back, doesn't it? Mm. Yes. There's another production with Kenneth Branagh mm. due uh, next year. Um, and I think it's a much richer and more densely textured play and it's got a great, great leading role. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are, people are bound to quarrel with my choices, but, I mean, that's part of the impetus behind mm. the book. You haven't made my review, but I did suggest that it would be possible to come up with 101 greatest plays that are completely different from this and be valid as well. Absolutely true. Not as good, but valid. No, no, I mean... No, because it would be leaving out the Hamlets you, and... You, you could do 101, mm. you know, and it would be equally valid, yes, it, because it would be your choice, and, and you could almost omit most of mine, actually, mm. and still come up with a list. Um, I mean, I could... I mean, even, I could I could alter my list even now, actually. Mm. I mean, the trouble is it's set in concrete. Yes. But as I look at it, I think, mm. oh, God, <laughs> you know. One of my colleagues, Susanna Clapp, said to me, Michael, do you think you'll find, as you see plays, you'll think, oh, why didn't I include that? Mm. Um, and the answer is yes. I do you think, as you see plays, you'll think, well, no, did I include that? Ah, see new no, productions of some of the ones that are in there. I think I will defend my existing choices, but I will also become aware of plays that you know yeah. should have made the final mm. cut. I mean, last week I saw at the National Theatre "Our Country's Good" by Tim Blake yes. Baker, mm. which is a play I admire deeply, mm. and I regret in a way it's not in the book yeah. because I think it, it deserves to be. And I think well, maybe I could have left out one of the more. Uh, one of the lesser-known ancient plays, you know, Kleist, the Broken Jug, let's say. Mm. But then I think, oh, no, I love the Broken <laughs> Jug, and I wanted that to be in. So it's very difficult to hit the mm. right balance. What were your criteria? Did you have set criteria, or is it just what you fancied on the day? <laughs> well, I mean, no, there were no sort of rigid criteria. It was the plays that I thought endured were capable of reinterpretation, uh, that were always being renewed. I mean, that applies mainly to old plays. And if they were new plays, 
They were places I thought had the capacity for renewal that would have a life beyond the immediate present. I mean, looking at the later plays, Jerusalem, for example, yeah. is in there. Well, I know it had that one great legendary production with Mark Rylance. Mm. I'm absolutely convinced someone will play that part again when the memory of Mark Rylance <laughs> has sort of faded a bit. Um, it will live on. I suppose that's controversial. My final choice is King Charles III. Mm. I think it's such a good play. Mm. I can see that being done um, at some point, maybe when he has become king. If that ever happens. If that ever happens, <laughs> which it will do, I assume. Um, so all the plays I've chosen, you know, David Hare's Racing Demon, you know, they're all there because I think they have some mm. potential mm. afterlife. Um, but um, you, criteria is a difficult one. Um, the criteria actually, funnily enough, emerged as I was writing the book rather than before. Mm. And as I was writing the book, I began to realise there is a there are certain patterns. Um, and one, I said in my first essay about Aeschylus that drama is the art of contradiction, and that seems obvious, but it is true actually. Mm. A, a play that does not have uh, powerfully expressed antithetical views tends not to survive. It seems to me, um, moral ambivalence, I think, is a quality mm. of drama. Um, a sense of reality is a, is a quality of drama. And, and this was crucial, I found, um, vibrant language. Language that sort of sticks in the memory. Um, not really because it's quotable, but because it has a sort of salty individuality. I mean, it's difficult with some of the plays in translation, so I'm relying on mm, the translator's yeah. um, use of the language. But do you see what I mean? I mean, whether it's the Elizabethans or whether it's Osborne or Pinter or Hare, I'm always looking for language that expresses the author's distinctive personality. Yes, and I think your choices probably do achieve that. You Sometimes it feels in the book as if you're using a single play by a writer to explore the whole opus of the writer. Well, that's a very shrewd point because, you know, particularly with modern drama, I've, I felt... I couldn't include more than one of most writers, mm. you know, one Osborne, one Pinter, mm. yeah, one yeah. Carol Churchill, etc. And therefore I have to choose what I think is the outstanding work of each writer. But you're quite right. That's meant to sort of epitomise their qualities in, in more general terms. I mean, people get more than one uh, play, or mostly the dead, you know. So yeah. Shakespeare gets six and, you know, Shaw gets, I mean, God only gets two. Uh, Kleist gets two. Shaw gets two. Ibsen gets Two or three, I can't remember. <laughs> and Chekhov gets two, you know. Mm. But most living writers, I can find myself to one play to give myself a sort of wider spread as possible. Mm. And d did you feel pained at having to leave anything out on using that measure that you, know, you couldn't use a second or third or fourth, as the case may be, play by, say, a Chekhov or an Ibsen? Yes, I did. Yes, because, um, I mean, I'm passionate about Ibsen, but, I mean, you can't include the whole... Ibsen Corpus, mm. you know, so I chose mm. um, Doll's House. Well, I chose three Ibsens, actually. <laughs> Brand, because that represents his early poetic phase and his sort of big epic quality. Mm. Doll's House for mm. fairly obvious reasons, I suppose. And The Wild Duck, because I think it's underrated. It doesn't get done very often these mm. days. It's too big a cast to be done easily. But I think that's Ibsen at his greatest, actually, uh, writing tragic comedy and also dealing with a theme which is... Um, our sort of capacity for illusion, really, um, that is so relevant today, um, and the dangers of the sort of false idealist. And at the time I was writing the essay, I was thinking of a production at the Donmar, which mm. came shortly after the Iraq War, and suddenly that play sprang into focus. You thought, yes, Tony Blair is actually a figure in The Wild Duck, or The Wild Duck <laughs> reflects something in Tony mm. Blair a kind of delude, deluded idealism that has catastrophic consequences. Mm. People who mean well invariably, um, not invariably, but frequently cause mm. disaster. So that was um, a sort of resonant theme. But you're absolutely right. Yes, one, one play has to stand for the body of work.
Michael Billington has just published The 101 Greatest Plays, which in a way could be regarded as, I was going to say memorial, that's clearly the wrong word, a tribute to his long career in theatre. Michael, um, you, it really is a long career in theatre now. I don't know, when you started, did you have any idea that you would still be writing in 2015? <laughs> I started in May 1965 on The Times, which is 50 years ago, oh, mm, just over 50 years ago. I didn't know that I'd be alive, let alone <laughs> still writing. No, I mean, one has no sense of, uh, one's, of the perspective of one's career. One's just grateful to be in work. Um, and I had six very happy years on The Times, actually, mm. covering not only theatre. I did film, I did television, I did lots of interviews. Um, and it was a sort of very productive period. And then I was picked up by The Guardian in 1971, and here I still am. And again, I, I feel a sense of mild astonishment, actually. <laughs> astonishment that I'm still here, that I'm still regarded as employable, and that editors are still, apparently, for the moment, anyway, happy to keep me going. Um, and when the subject has come up, and it does come up, obviously, at various times, you know, about retirement... And I broached the subject, and I've been encouraged by touch wood by my um, editors and employees of the Guardian to, to carry on. And by your readers, I would have thought. Well, I don't know about that, <laughs> <laughs> because you never quite know what the readers... I think it depends on generations. I mean, I think I have loyal old readers who've been with me, as it were, you mm. know, for those 50 or 40 years mm. or so. Um, I'm not sure about young readers, because if you look at the website and if you look at the bloggers, mm. I feel there's a generation of younger bloggers who regard me perfectly reasonably, I suppose, um, as a bit of an old bore. I was going to use the word old fart, but what <laughs> word do you want to use? You know, who should who retreated some time ago and who is out of touch with contemporary theatre and contemporary theatre developments. I mean... This is the price you pay, really, for age and for longevity. You're going to inevitably uh, have loyalty from some sections of your readership and hostility from others. But, I mean, that one has to live with. How did you get into it to start with? Um, I always wanted to do it. It was a case of finding someone to employ me. I mean, very briefly, um, I was a bit... Destitute. This was summer of 1965. I'd come to London the previous year. I'd knocked around. I'd done a bit of journalism. I'd worked in a theatre for two years. I'd done various odd jobs. But I was sort of a bit rudderless at the age of 25. And Sheridan Morley happened to come to tea at my flat one day. He said, why don't you write to John Lawrence at the Times? He was the mm. artist at the Times. He said, why don't you write for the Times? We all do. The rest of us <laughs> do. He said, well, why don't I give it a go? I wrote to this man, John Lawrence, mm. and he turned into... My patron saint, mm. actually. Um, not only mine, mm. Irving Wardle, John Peter, a whole generation of critics were mm. uh, encouraged and championed mm. by this man. And he just gave me work, gave me a test review straight away. I went down to Bristol to see St Joan with Barbara Lee Hunt. <gasps> not with her, but to see mm, yes. <laughs> um, And I came back and the next day he asked me to write the film column for the following week and it just multiplied mm. and mushroomed from there. And it was thanks to him I... You know, survived and got got a, a sort of niche. Just one point, in those days, we were all anonymous on the Times. There were no bylines, mm. so no-one knew mm. who I was, mm. as it were. Um, and then about 1968, I suppose, uh, the Times suddenly started publishing bylines, so then at least one had uh, credit for what one was did, doing. Did that in any way change the nature of what you wrote? I think it did, in a way, because without a byline... You tended to write, or you were encouraged to write almost, in this rather lofty patrician style, as if you were some omniscient figure. And I remember, but you are some omniscient no, figure. I'm not, no, you're not. No, you know, you know as well as I do that all criticism is based on uh, subjective reactions mm. and partial responses. Mm. But the style of the times, but you couldn't use the first person singular, obviously, yeah. mm. meant that it seemed as if the reviews had some um, slightly bogus authority, I would mm. say. And I remember being told, it was straight, remember, you're not giving your opinion, you're giving the Times' his opinion. Well, I didn't question that, but I thought, well, the Times doesn't have an opinion. In the end, it's me, or whoever, Irving, or whoever's writing, you know, masking their subjective reaction mm. under the guise of objectivity. Mm. And I think it is dishonest in the end in criticism. Mm. I think all criticism should be mm. signed. Um, 
Anyway, finally in 68, we, our names appeared, and then uh, I was happily headhunted by The Guardian when my Frick Wallace started to fall ill. This is going to sound clichéd, and I apologise, but was there a big change moving from the newspaper record, as The Times was, and some might argue still is, mm-hmm. to what was the match, The Guardian, I don't know if it was at that time or not, and was reputed to be a newspaper more on the left? Um, it's a good question. <clears throat> I think... I mean, I hadn't changed, I don't think, personally, but I think I was freed up, or liberated is a better word, by writing for The Guardian, because I, I knew that The Guardian, yes, was addressing a liberal audience or a soft-left audience <laughs> or whatever word you want to use, um, and therefore I didn't have to any longer conceal my partiality for political plays, plays on public themes, <laughs> plays on public issues. And when I joined... Um, the Guardian in 71, it was a time when political theatre in Britain was mushrooming, mm. you know, it really was. The mm. 70s were the big time when people thought by writing, uh, putting on a play in a cellar in London, you could bring down the government somehow. <laughs> and there was a kind of optimism and mm. idealism then that theatre had a, a vital oppositional role. And I was very much supporting and encouraging that movement. And I was lucky because I coincided with the arrival of a whole generation of writers mm. like... David Edgar, David Hare, um, Howard Brenton, Trevor mm. Griffiths, Carol Churchill, you know, who were all... They weren't, they weren't identical, obviously, but they were all... Uh, they all believed in theatre's progressive role, and therefore I was on a paper that could encourage that. How have things changed? Because obviously paper has given way to the internet, budgets have been slashed, generally speaking. Has it affected you significantly? I think... What changes are the circumstances under which, under which one writes? Or the, you know, the technology obviously changes. So, you know, one no longer has to phone copy yeah. through to a you mm. know, um, you know, deaf copy taker. I shouldn't say that. Mm. Um, um, you know, so you're responsible now for, this, for the transmission of the material, mm. obviously. And if the mistakes appear, they're more mm. likely to yeah. be your mistakes. I mean, that's changed radically. Uh, the rapid rebuttal has changed now because any opinion you express in a review mm. is within seconds mm. being challenged, interestingly so, yeah. healthily so, by readers, bloggers. Mm. That's, that's good. Um, I suppose space is something that changes and the status of the review. Um, and I think, not on The Guardian, but in general, criticism is now seen as part of the consumer industry And our role as critics, it seems increasingly, is to give stars, give points, Mm. uh, advise people to go or not to go. Um, Whereas I was always bred to believe that criticism was part of a sort of... um, uh, was a product of, you know, um, I don't know, um, research, information, uh, putting working context, and was an essay, not simply saying go or Mm. don't go. Mm. Having said that, I must quickly add, The Guardian is marvellous at its flexibility because if there is a big event or a substantial event, you know, they suddenly give me um, lots of space. I mean, to give an obvious example, the Cumberbatch Hamlet last week... You were going to say that. (laughs) Yes, well, yes, thousand words front page. Mm. So I'm I'm not complaining. Um, But I'm making a point about criticism. The function of criticism, I think, has changed, or the role of criticism has changed more in the last 40 Mm. years. It's less about a stylish, stylish essay, and it's more about... Uh, it's more utilitarian, I think. Mm. That's the general point. And what about the theatre itself? Because, as you said, political plays really took off in the 1970s. Yes. We're now in an age where there are still political plays around, there are still well-made and well-written plays around. There's a lot of devised theatre, musicals, yes. all sorts of things going on, performance pieces that are very hard to categorise. Is that a, has that significantly changed your life, your career? Well, I mean... And I'm sorry, maybe what's happened along the way. Yes. I mean, the theatre has changed, you're quite right. I, I remember something Arthur Miller once said about Broadway. He said, we don't have plays, we have shows. And I feel a lot of London theatre, particularly the West End commercial theatre, is about shows. Mm. And everything has to be, quotes an event of some, in some mm. shape or form. Therefore, there is less room for you know, the moderately serious and intelligent well-made play that runs to an half hours, that's more or less gone by the board now. Everything has to be a splashy event in some shape or form. 
And even, I would say, in the subsidised theatre, there are strong pressures now to produce shows. And I'm, I'm treading carefully here, but I think that young directors particularly feel, if they deal with the classic, they can't simply reanimate the classic. They have to possibly rewrite it. Um, reimagine is the big word. If you look at many brochures now, you'll see a reimagined version of plays from the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. And I keep thinking, I want to see plays restored, but I don't want to see every play necessarily reimagined or tricked out with big scenery or with lots of music or whatever. And I just wish we could veer back a bit towards respect for the word, respect for the author, respect for the intention of the play, rather than feeling it has to be a demonstration of directorial versatility. It's strange, isn't it? Because there can be now... And I felt with the Benedict Cumberbatch Hamlet that maybe Lindsay Turner felt that she needed to appeal to an audience that was going to be Benedict Cumberbatch friendly, his uh, screaming fans. And therefore, she reinvented a Hamlet for that reason, which maybe is exactly what the producers wanted and what... Um, the actors want, and certainly the audiences. Well, yes, I mean, it, it's a sort of... You could say it's a quite flashy production. I mean, the central problem with it, for me, is that it's all about Cumberbatch. Not his fault, but the other actors, the other characters, don't come into clear definition in a good production of Hamlet. They do. I mean, going back briefly, when David Tennant played Hamlet for mm. the RSC, Tennant was a big star, mm, yes. charismatic figure, media figure. But at the same time, the production by Greg Doran explored all the intricate sub-relationships in the play and everyone's relationship to Hamlet, that doesn't quite happen. It doesn't happen at all, I think, in the Cumberbatch version. Uh, I'm just saying, I think because it, it's a very competitive world for directors these days, and to make their mark, they have to have some sort of, uh, I don't know, um, extravagant scenic device or some interpolated music, um, whatever, to make sure that we register them. Mm. And I think... The, the, the best directors are not necessarily so involved with self-advertising. Mm. Was that not always the case for no, the good directors 30, 40 years ago not doing no, the same? No, I don't think so. No, I, mean, I, I hope I'm not being <laughs> falsely nostalgic, but I think there was a generation of directors, I would name names, actually, mm. were people like John Dexter, people like Bill Gaskell, people like Peter Gill, you know, mm. who's still working, yep. um, whose absolute preoccupation was with text, 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 meaning, mm. meaning, meaning, um, and who didn't develop an individual style of their own, mm. but by God, they really did um, give you a classic um, mm. in all its richness. I mean, I just going to cite just specific examples. Mm, I met John Dexter doing a St. Joan many years ago, mm. early days of the National Theatre with Joan Plowright. It was an exemplary production. Mm. You know, it caught all the vitality of the play, all the musicality of the language, great central performance by Joan Plowright. Now, if a director does St. Joan, and there was one at the National Theatre not so long ago, mm. um, it became Mar Marion Elliott's, I think, yes. With Anne-Marie Duff. Yes. Mm. Um, it wasn't a bad production, but it, again, it had, to, it had to be showy. It actually put on stage the burning of St. Joan, mm. We actually saw the flames mm. licking her feet, as it were. Where the whole point of Shaw's play was not to show mm. the actual physical burning. It was to deal mm. with the intellectual and philosophical arguments around the burning and the case for mm. burning St. Joan. Um, so that's just one example. So I think there was a time when directors were more stringent in exploring text than they are now. Are there any plays that you dread... Or plays that you... Well, there must be loads of plays that you've hated, but plays that you dread, sort of plays in the canon that you just hope don't come round again. I can't, no, I can't think of any plays that I dread. And if I did, I wouldn't go to them. Yeah. I mean, that's mm. a, a very simple point. I actually select the plays I go to see. So mm. I avoid things that I have a sort of built-in antipathy yeah. towards. I mean, that can change. I used to think that mine was not my... Mm. By, by thing, but I've now come to learn. Puppets, I used to think, were not my bag, um, and I've learned to like puppets <laughs> up to a point. Um, I suppose, if I'm honest, um, no, there are no plays I will duck. I think certain musicals I will duck. Mm. I think, why do I need to see yeah. another jukebox musical? Mm. Um, I'm not against mythology musicals, but I think you know, if it's obviously a manufactured musical built around someone's back catalogue, I think, mm. does it need my... Mm. Um, 
presence? Mm. And the answer is no, it doesn't. So I pick and choose what I go and see. You still go and see a remarkable... I think of the major critics, you probably go to the theatre more often than anybody else. I take it that's just because you enjoy it and you love going. Well, yes, and I, I, mean, I like going to small theatres in London, mm. or, or, or regional theatres if I can. Um, yeah, I'm pretty omnivorous in that sense, and I'm always, you know, uh, like Autolycus in The Winter's Tale, you know, picker up of unconsidered trifles. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm always looking for things of interest. Uh, but if it's a dull week, a dull-looking week on paper, mm. and I will only go three times. I mm. don't force myself to go mm. inordinately. But, you know, we both know there's a group of small theatres in London. We've mentioned two of them, the Orange Tree and the Finbar, that are mm. consistently interesting. Yes. And I want to see what's going on there. The Alcola, I like to see what's going on there. Southwark Playhouse, I like to see what's yeah. going on there. Yeah. There's a, a ring of smaller theatres around mm. London that I, I tend to go to as often as possible. I was going to say, are there any theatres that you avoid? But I'd better not say that because you no, might ask the question. No, there aren't. There are theatres that one changes one's response mm. to. And I'll name one, mm. Shakespeare's Globe. Mm. When it started, I was deeply sceptical, deeply sceptical. Mm. I thought it would mean going to watch produ- bad productions of Cymbeline through a thin drizzle you know, on <laughs> July afternoons. Well, it can mean that. Yeah. But I think in the last few years, I've begun to respect what they're doing and to see a much uh, richer variety of performances mm. than was true in the first few years uh, when Mark Rylance yes. initially dominated mm. it. I think now the, the ensemble is generally better mm. and some of the productions are very good. So, I mean, I go there um, now with, with enthusiasm rather than mm. reluctance. And generally, once again, we seem to be having a changeover of artistic directors at various theatres, the National, the Globe... Um, several others which will come to mind in a minute. Yes. Um, which changes the character of things, and presumably you always regard... Well, you seem to be an optimistic person, because you couldn't go to the theatre minimum three times a week, four, five, six or seven, unless you no. believe that the next production is going to be the one every time. I've said this before, and it's true. One of the things that sustains me is what's around the corner. And when I think of retiring, which I do, you know, quite often, I think, oh, yes, but... Um, and I... I was just do, doing today a list of the autumn preview, you know, and think, my God, I, I don't want to miss that. Oh, there's a revival of waste. Oh, there's a Kenneth Branagh season coming at the Garrick. Mm. Oh, they're doing three Chekhovs in one day at Chichester. You know, mm. there's always something. This is the danger of theatre. It, mm. it is so seductive. Um, and it is a habit that is very hard to kick. Mm. But I find one reason I do keep going is because of the anticipation of... Uh, the future, there's always something potentially exciting. And do you enjoy the writing part of it? Because a lot of people love going to the theatre and they oh, the writing, it's a chore. No, I find the writing a constant challenge. Um, I swear, quite literally, that it is... It doesn't get any easier, um, even after 50 years, 50 years, you know. And it remains a constant daily stimulus and challenge... Mm. Because however often you've been doing it, you still haven't got it right. And you still feel there must be better ways of beginning a review and explaining the themes of a play. Now, I find it an intellectual stimulus to sit down in the morning, which I now do, and file by 10am, um, to sort of order my thoughts about the night before. The morning after thing is important. I find... Um, I think my best writing is done in bed. By that I mean, I mean, I mm. do actually sleep on the mm. play. Mm. Uh, I sleep with the play. Mm. And sometimes I wake up in the morning and the play has come yeah. into focus. Mm. Whereas at night, at 10 o'clock at night, it's still, you know, a bit fussy. Mm. But hopefully with the morning comes some form of illumination. No, I find putting the words on paper or on the screen is... It's like doing the crossword puzzle every day, only more exciting. Mm. With Twitter and bloggers and equivalents around, do you think criticism, theatre criticism, has a future? Do you think somebody starting up in criticism today will still be doing it in 2065? Um, I, I, I believe it has a future. I believe there will always be a need for someone who specialises in a particular field, whether it is the theatre or whether it is football or whether it is politics, someone who, you know, devotes their energies to one particular discipline or subject and can write about it and put things in context. And I don't see why theatre should be any different from other human activities. 
what will change, obviously, is the format in which the review appears. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if I was 25 today, I'd be, you know, looking for a website I could work for, creating my own website or whatever, rather than assuming there was a slot on a national daily paper. Mm -hmm. When I grew up, that was the assumption, or the hope. Mm -hmm. Not the assumption, the hope that one day someone would employ on the national daily. I mean, obviously, all national dailies are now... uh, you know, under under pressure, and the idea of a critic um, staying with one paper is getting increasingly mm. uh, unlikely. Mm. As there's much more mobility now, if that's a polite way of <laughs> putting it. Polite way of putting it. Um, and we're like football managers now. It seems to me, you know, we're constantly being sort of transferred or shunted around or moving around. Um, so I don't suppose anyone will have my weird, strange. Mm. Uh, lifelong, you know, devotion to one paper, one paper's acceptance of me. But I believe it will, criticism will continue because, you know, comment, opinion, contextualising the event will always be vital. There's someone who's got to devote their lives, I think, to the to the art form, as opposed to treating it as a sort of, you know, once a week hobby. Michael Bennington, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.